on me. How many of you have noticed that there are people in this world that are different from you? Raise your hand. <laughs> All right, so again, we're in the same boat. Maybe you live with or you work with at least one or two people like this who aren't exactly like you. And maybe you've had the urge to ask them, as my mother asked me so many times when I was growing up, what on earth were you thinking? <laughs> So this morning, we're going to get really personal with the personalities and answer the question, what on earth are these different people thinking? Now, I'd love to be able to promise that I can teach you how to read minds, especially the male mind, but I cannot promise that. Okay? I, 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 that's something I can't do. But what I am going to try to do is give you some tools that you can use to help figure out your own personality and then to figure out the personality needs and goals of those around you. Uh, I was talking to my high school students, I teach senior AP English, and I was talking to them about the personalities, and of course their big thing is don't label me, don't put me in a box, they all want to be so unique and so individual, and they all want to do it all at the exact same time in the same way often. Um, so let me just start by promising that I'm not here to label. One person once said, it's not that we put people in boxes, it's just we look into the boxes and whoop, there they are. They just kind of show up that way. And of course, we are mostly blends of the different personalities. I don't have time to talk about the combinations today. I'm just going to talk about each of the four. And as you maybe take the time to do the assessment on your own, um, you'll discover more about them. But the reason that I'm so um, passionate about the personalities is because this is a tool that God literally used to save my life when I was 17. Um, I was dying of an eating disorder. I started out anorexic, and then I got hungry, and I became bulimic for about five years in there. Before I left for college, I was hospitalized in the Brea Neuropsychiatric Institute Eating Disorder Unit, and uh, was really, really this close to having to be actually hospitalized and put on IVs. And the reason for that is that I had tried my entire growing up years to be somebody that God did not create me to be. Maybe some of you know what that experience is like. And so my mother went to hear Florence Littauer speak on the personalities, and she came home, and she gave us all the tests, and her worst fears were confirmed, that she was the only sane human being in a house full of crazies, which in a moment you'll understand means she was the only melancholy in a house full of sanguines. But when I discovered what my personality was supposed to be and how God actually created me to be, and I started living like that, I discovered that I actually kind of liked who I really was and I didn't like the person I was trying to be just to get the approval of my parents and my teachers. And so then my, um, I, I met my husband, and of course, you know, across the crowded room, there's my polar opposite, so we were meant for each other because we complete each other. No, um, that's just, that only happens in movies, but we are polar opposites, and God did put us together for reasons. Um, and part of the reason is that we would never depend so much on each other that we would forget to depend on him. Um, and so for us, that's been, been huge. But we would have either killed each other or divorced years ago. We just celebrated our 25th wedding anniversary Yay. on September. Thank you, thank you. No credit here, trust me. I would have left me years ago if I could. In fact, uh, a few years ago, I went into counseling again, and, and I was spouting off about my husband. And the counselor looked at me, and she said, isn't it amazing, Sherry, that after 23 years, he's still trying to make you happy? I thought, well, when you put it that way, <laughs> yeah, it really is. And then once we, uh, we got married and we had our children, they are also opposite personalities. So if you look up here, this is my dominant personality, this is my husband. I gave birth, my firstborn is this up here, and my secondborn is this down here. So in our family, we have all four personalities. And if I hadn't have known the personality information um, as they were younger, I would have tried to parent them identically. And if you're a parent or a grandparent or an aunt, if you deal with children at all, you know what works for one does not always work for the other. And you're like, well, what's wrong? I'm the same person. Well, the answer is they're not. So um, I'm not going to ask each of you to actually take the test right now, although you're welcome to take home and do it. You can use pencil and you know, share it around the family if you want to. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to teach you some visible clues to look for. First of all, it's faster. And second of all, it is much more socially acceptable than actually going and um, handing a test to somebody and saying, please fill this out. I want to know why you're such a hard person to get along with. So the verse that we're going to use as our foundation is this one right here from Romans 12, 18. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Now, personally, I really tend to want to gravitate toward that first line, if it is possible. And I want to go, no, it's not. They're just too difficult. They're an impossible person. And I guarantee you every single one of us have an impossible person in our lives, but it's not who we think it is. The next line, as far as it depends on you, and this is where what I'm hoping is that the information I'm going to share with you gives you 
um, more freedom, gives you more options, so that as far as it depends on you, actually expands. And so that your relationships actually will depend a little bit more heavily on your ability to adapt and your ability um, to be creative. And then you'll have the ability to live at peace with everyone. So like I said, the assessment is something you can do on your own time. So let's start out with the first personality, the, the popular sanguine. And it's the easiest to identify. We, the order I do these in is simply the ease of identification, not the order of importance of any of them. Because we're each, we need all four personalities in order to reflect the character of God. Yes? Do you have any more up there? I absolutely do. If somebody would grab them, they're right up here. And um, yeah, absolutely. Don't want anybody left out here. So tell me what you notice about the person that's represented up here. What do you see visually? Bright. Bright, Bright okay? Bright color. What else do you notice about it? Funky. He's kind of funky looking, okay? Decorated. Decorated, it's shiny. What else? It's a very happy looking purse, okay? Now as far as functionality goes, do you notice any compartments? Okay, this is a dig and dump purse, right? You're either going to be digging and everything's at the bottom, or you're going to have to dump the whole thing out and spread around and try to find it. This is not something that is heavily organized. And so all of these words we've just looked at reflect the sanguine personality, the popular personality. The first visible clue, I'm going to give you three visible clues, that you are somebody that you know is a sanguine personality is openness. Um, the mouth is open. Sanguines are talkers. That's the first thing that you'll see. So when I walk into a room and I want to know who my sanguines are, I just look and see who's talking. Um, body language is very open. They tend to be huggers and touchers. And my daughter was what people used to think was a clinger. They thought she was very shy and insecure, and it had nothing to do with that. She would leave me any time, but she just loved the touch. She was like a fifth appendage. You know, I had two arms, two legs, and Anne Marie, <laughs> because she loved that touch. And then the life is very open. Okay? Do not tell your secrets to a sanguine unless you want the whole world to know. And it's very simple. It's just there's no filter between the brain and the mouth. If it comes to mind, it comes out the mouth, and then they go, oops, didn't mean to. Um, sanguines tend to be social learners, which means they don't know what they think until they say it. And when I first told that to my husband, he was horrified. You mean you don't think it all through thoroughly? I'm like, if I thought it through thoroughly, I'd never open my mouth. He then thought that might be a good idea, but we didn't go down that road. <laughs> visible clue that you or someone you know might be a sanguine personality is that you or they are loud. So again, if they're talking, they're talking loudly, making it very easy. You go to a party, you go to any set, a social setting, and it's really easy to figure out who the sanguines are. Their voice is loud, their color choices are loud. Um, I'm not really uh, dressed particularly sanguine today. If I were, I'd need something a little more neon, the, the pink on your Women Alive shirts, very nice and sanguine. Um, and uh, part of it is that they have a desperate fear of blending in. I mean, this purse, of the, the yellow purse that I showed, that was meant to be noticed. Okay, that is meant for people. I have a skirt I love to wear because wherever I go the day I'm wearing that skirt, people stop me and touch it and tell me how beautiful it is. And that is my goal. <laughs> I want to be noticed and you know, they'll tell me that seeing my skirt makes them happy and I'm like, yeah, okay, this all now makes me happy too. So the third visible clue is clutter. <laughs> They have a cluttered life. Their purse tends to be cluttered. Their car tends to be cluttered. My husband has been known to refer to my car as a traveling trash truck, which I think is unfair, although true, and their desk. They tend to be the queen of chaos, and it doesn't really bother them until they can't find something, but then they might just buy another one. So let's get personal with a sanguine. The goal in life of a sanguine is represented by this party invitation. And for those of you who are not sanguine, you're going to come to me afterwards and you're going to say, okay, but when they grow up, they get a real goal, right? And the answer is no. Whether they are two years old or 102, the goal of a sanguine is always the same, and it is to have fun. There you have it. Sanguine's goal in life is to have fun. And if fun is not currently happening, want to guess what a sanguine will do? They will create it. I, this is something I have to be very aware of in the classroom. If my sanguines start looking bored, I've got like two minutes to figure out a way to add some humor or levity or something before they take over and start doing the class clown routine, which of course the rest of the class loves because they want the break. So the um, goal in life of a, a sanguine is to have fun. I had a student a few years ago, very, very tall, his name was Colin, and he had a habit of walking into class just a little bit late, 
And if you've ever been around a teenage boy when they're going through the growth spurt and they're kind of in that awkward stage, everything they do is kind of funny because they're trying to control their legs and arms and it's just not working really well. So he came into class late and he's tripping over things and falling into things and he's not really doing it on purpose, but it's just getting funnier and funnier. Of course, I as a teacher am trying to keep a straight face, keep order in the classroom, but he's just this naturally funny kid, so I'm trying not to snicker. And so he finally sits down and he looks up at me and I'm standing over him trying to look, you know, stern and disciplinary. And he's like, I'm sorry, Mrs. T, but you have to admit it was funny. <laughs> and of course, at that point, I'm like, fine, fine, you got me. I'm a saying, but yes, it was funny, but stop, don't do it again. We have to, you know, talk about Pygmalion today. Um, but the reason why I could, I could kind of identify with him is I am known to say absolutely anything to get a laugh. Um, when my kids were two and four, my husband, who you're, you'll hear about in a moment, under the melancholy, who is this long-suffering man, he got up early on the weekend, he went out into the backyard, he mowed the lawn, he then clipped some of the, um, the dill that he was growing in his herb garden, and he made scrambled eggs for breakfast. Okay, I'm married to this amazing man, this, you know, almost close to a god on earth, right? So we sit down, kids are two and four, and my kids had never seen eggs with herbs in them, because heaven only knows I've never done that. And so they look at it and they're like, Mama, what's this green stuff in our eggs? And remember what I said about the, there's no filter? I looked at them and I said, oh, well, Daddy mowed the lawn this morning. <laughs> Some melancholy woman will come up to me later and say, you don't deserve that, man. And I'll say, you are absolutely right. Because what happened next is both kids burst out crying so hard, they couldn't eat breakfast. And for like the next few years, they wouldn't touch eggs. Because they were just so horrified that their father, and of course, I told them he hadn't. He told them he hadn't, and it was hopeless. It was the whole breakfast was ruined. And here, he has gotten up early. He has no reward for his efforts. And what am I doing? I'm still dying laughing. I think it's one of the funniest things I've ever done. And it, 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 the whole topic comes up like once a year and he glares at me. And I just, I'm like, oh, yeah, that was, that was a stellar moment as a sanguine. So, so uh, to have fun, and I'm, it wasn't fun for him, but it was fun for me. And a bunch of you left, so that was good. All right, two primary needs of a sanguine personality. The first one is represented by a cell phone. And it is not that they have to have constant connection with everybody, although that is something they think is a need. But it, this is here to represent attention, constant attention. When my daughter was a toddler and she could walk and talk, I felt stopped. Okay? Some of you may have had that experience, like everywhere you go in the house, they're following you. And so I have a whole story I tell about that when I speak to mops groups. Well, one day I had come home from a mops group. My husband was home for lunch, and I was telling him what a wonderful time I had speaking to the mops moms. And, and uh, he was done in the kitchen with his lunch, so he goes down the hall to his music studio. Well, I wasn't done talking to him. So I followed him down the hallway to his music studio, and he got done doing what he wanted to do there, and he left to go to the, be uh, the bathroom. Now, I did not follow him into the bathroom, but I went into our master bedroom, and I sat on the bed until he came out so I could keep talking to him. And what occurred to me is one of the things we had talked about in the mops group was, well, this um, stalking behavior, you know, <laughs> saying ones do grow out of it, don't they? And I realized, no, we don't grow out of it. We will track somebody down. Uh, people think that ignoring a sanguine will cause us to go away. No, it will just make us all the more determined to hold you down, to say what we want to say, and then we might let you go. That's how badly we need attention. And often if we can't get positive attention, we'll go for negative attention, because bad breath is better than no breath at all. Sanguines need attention that badly. And then the second primary need is represented by this Visa card. No, ladies, it is not shopping. I'm sorry. Shopping is not a real need. We just wish it was. We wish it was like an Olympic sport, and then we could, you know, get gold medals in it. But this represents, when you get the receipt, what does it say at the bottom? It says approved. So this represents approval. Saying ones need approval. And some of you look old enough to, to remember when Sally Fields actually gave her speech, and the rest of you probably heard it spoofed or seen it on YouTube. When Sally Fields got her Oscar, what did she say? You like me. You really like me. And us saying ones are there going, you just go, Sally, we get you, we get you, because we want approval so badly. So here's what a sanguine is thinking, perhaps not consciously, but these are the three questions that run through a sanguine's mind and that run, often run her emotions and are part of her choices. First of all, are we having fun yet? How can I make this all about me? And what will it take to make you like, no, what will it take to make you love me? 
Those are the three questions that a Sanguine is asking. All right. That, please? Yeah, are we having fun yet? How can I make this all about me? And what will it take to make you like me? No, actually, what will it take to make you love me? All right, what do you notice about this purse? Quiet. What else? Functional. Very functional, very practical. What else? It has a lock on it. It has a lock on it, so it's very secure. Yes. Okay. What else? Plain. Okay, plain. Okay. Um, when I'm speaking to a group with lots of sanguines, somebody usually goes, boring. And I come back with plastic. <laughs> All right, it's all in the, in the word choice here. Um, <laughs> if you were to open this up, what would you expect to see inside a purse like this? Order. Lots of zippers and separate little compartments. Okay, lots of features, and it's a, a deep navy color because melancholies are very deep people. All right, so the visible clues that you're going to see when you are noticing that you or, or, or somebody that you know is a melancholy personality, and these are opposites, by the way. It's one of the reasons that we put them side by side is for comparison. The first thing is that they're closed. The same one is open, and the melancholy is closed. And the first thing that's closed is their mouth, because they do not believe that God placed them on earth to fill the world with Babylon chatter which is kind of what they think that the same ones are busy doing. <laughs> their body language tends to be much more closed. Okay? If, if they're going to touch, it's likely to be a, a handshake, because what does that give? About a two-foot barrier if both people yes. put their hands out? It's going to give a bubble. They have a huge need for personal space. Uh, my son is about half melancholy, and even when he was little, if I would just reach over and ruffle his hair, he'd be like, Mom! And it wasn't the hair. It was that I'd invaded his personal space. And I'm a real touchy person, and I love that. And so it's like, it would be really easy to assume that my child didn't love me. And it's like, no, that's just not his particular need. His love language doesn't happen to be um, physical touch. And then their life tends to be very closed. Um, you're going to find out things from a melancholy on a need to know basis. And you might be surprised at how little they think you need to know. <laughs> That could be a whole other seminar, but I'm just going to move on. The second visible clue is that they are quiet. And so first of all, if they are closed and their mouth is closed, when they do open their mouth to speak, they're not going to be yelling and shouting and waving their hands. They're going to be speaking in a much more quiet, perhaps serious, perhaps earnest tone. And then some wild sanguine comes in and interrupts what they were telling. Do you think the melancholy is going to start their story back up again? No. They're going to shut down. They're going to wait to see if anybody else in that circle cared enough to prompt them to start again. And if nobody does, they're going to feel hurt that nobody was really listening to them. And this has been something I have had to learn the hard way, because I'm usually the same one who's coming in and doing the interrupting. And then I'm like, well, they didn't start talking again. They must not want to, so I'll just fill in the gaps. And that's not how melancholies work at all. Um, and the other thing that tends to be quiet is their color choices. Um, often they're dressed in monochromatic um, black or navy or gray or taupe or off-white. And part of the reason is they want to blend in. They do not want to be noticed. They don't want to stand out. They don't want anybody grabbing them and saying, I love your skirt. That would probably be offensive. Um, if somebody reached out and grabbed them for what they were wearing. And so the next visible clue is that things are, if, if the other desk was uh, the worst mess you've probably seen, neat and tidy. A place for everything and everything in its place. All right? So getting personal here with a melancholy personality, the goal of a melancholy um, personality's life can be represented by this can of extra hold hairspray. And that is that their goal in life is perfection. They want to get everything perfect and keep it that way. Now just pause a moment and think about what kind of a challenge this presents for the melancholy homemaker. Because she can clean that house until 2 in the morning and get it absolutely perfect. But what happens sometime after the sun rises? The people, the people wake up and mess everything. And it took me years to realize that my husband's need for perfection, to have things a certain way, is just as legitimate as my need to have fun. Our society does not support this. If you want to have fun, you're great. You're a, everybody loves you. If you want to have things just so, oh, well, you just need to get your shorts out of a wad. You just need to relax or whatever. It's like, no, 
that need is just as great as this need. There's no one that's more valid than the other. When we start doing a hierarchy, that's when we start saying, well, that's when we move into contempt, because contempt says, I am above you, and I get to make decisions about you. Mm -hmm. And we don't have that option. It's, it's something that's going to absolutely destroy relationships. And so when I started protecting the areas that my husband wanted to have perfect, like the spices, he doesn't like it when he reaches for what he thinks is nutmeg and gets cayenne pepper. <laughs> I know, it just is not something that works well for him. Um, and so that need to have things stay and the recognition that things yeah. don't stay perfect and the, the regret of that um, is represented in this little story about my daughter. She was probably about seven and my husband made her go outside and do some weeding with him. Well, she didn't want to do the weeding. It didn't seem like fun. She's part sanguine. Um, but she had no choice and so she turned it into a game and after about two hours they were, well, she was finished with her, her spot. So she stands up, all proud of herself, and she tells my husband, she says, I'm done. And he responds, as only a melancholy can, he says, no, you're not. They'll grow back. <laughs> because you really, they, a melancholy realizes you can get everything just right, but it's not going to last. And their desire is for it to last, not just to get it there once, but they wish it could last that way forever. All right, the first primary need of a melancholy is represented here, and it's not that it's money, but by the way, if you ever need to borrow money from somebody, don't, don't check with a sanguine. They have none. Your melancholy is your better bet. If you're melancholy, don't loan money to anybody. It will ruin your relationships and, and lose all the sanguines who are trying to get your money because they just want money, not friendship. Um, but the, this represents order. Order. Notice that all the money is in... You know, it's facing the correct way, and it's in the correct denominations, the ones, the fives, the tens, the whatever. They want things in a certain order. Now, years ago, my daughter was in high school, and she used to clean house for a particular teacher. Her name was um, Miss Dimmy. Miss Dimmy, there we go, got it right. And so the first time she cleaned house for her, she went over and uh, Miss Dinning had a bunch of these tiny little figurines that my German grandmother would have called Gingerlitzchen, just a ton of little tiny stuff. So my daughter moved it all aside, dusted underneath, and put, put everything back, and then moved on to a different room. Well, she happened to take a look and she saw Miss Dinning shaking her head and going and moving everything back exactly where it was supposed to have been. Now, two things happened. First of all, my daughter, remember, and she is part Sanguine, and remember Sanguine wants approval, she felt bad. Because having things moved meant she had not done a good job, and she wasn't going to get the approval she sought. But this is where I think the, that knowing the personalities, it can be such a strength. And I've been teaching it to my kids since they were old enough to start saying polysyllabic words. I mean, they, they've known what a Sanguine and melancholy and all this is since they were tiny. She got the idea after Miss Dinning left. The next time she came to do the um, house cleaning, she pulled out her cell phone, and before she moved all the little figures, she took photos of everything the way Miss Dinning wanted it. Then she moved everything, did all the dusting, moved everything back, so that when Miss Dinning came back, she was delighted. She was so surprised. My daughter's need to be affirmed and approved of was met, and Miss Dinning's need for order was met. But if you take a look at what happened, the dynamics of what happened, Reorganizing everything perfectly did not meet a core need of my daughter. Okay? She could care less. But she was able to be selfless and get outside of herself and think to herself, this is gonna make this is gonna meet somebody else's needs. It's gonna make their, their day better. And so the ability to do that improved her life and improved their relationship overall. Mm -hmm. And did it hurt her to do that? Mm -hmm. You know, what did it take another extra five minutes? And that kind of willingness to say, okay, this isn't who I am but I care enough about another person that I'm gonna adjust, I'm gonna adapt. Did she completely change who she was? No. But she flexed just enough to be able to meet somebody else's need. And when she came home, she was so excited. And I thought, yeah, that's, that's the kind of value that I see in this information. And then the second basic need of a melancholy is represented by the sensitive eye saline solution. Because melancholies are very sensitive to others and they need others to be sensitive back but they tend to make friends with very insensitive people who don't remember things like birthdays or favorite colors or if they collect cows or if they collect frogs or anything like that. So they need people to be sensitive to them. Uh, my mother is a melancholy personality and we have struggled our entire life. She has not understood me at all. I mean, that was one of her favorite phrases. I simply do not understand you. 
It's like, okay, I'm back at you, Mom. I mean, there, I never said that because she was very German and I would never consider saying that out loud, but we never really understood each other. And so when it came time for holidays, I never knew what to give my mother for Christmas. And um, one year, I got it right. One year, all of my life, she was a fifth grade teacher um, before she had children. Uh, back in the 1950s, and all my life, I remember hearing her talk about the book she taught reading at it. It was called Engine Whistles. And she would always say, I wish I could get a hold of a copy. I wish I had kept a copy of that. And I don't remember, probably 10 years ago, I finally paused long enough, stopped thinking about myself, and started thinking about the, you know, life from her point of view. And I was like, I sell books online all the time, half.com. You can get used books so easily these days. And so I rushed to the computer, I typed in Engine Whistles, there were tons of editions available. I called my dad, found out the exact year, so I could get the exact teacher's edition, student edition, and workbooks in perfect condition. And I could not wait until Christmas that year. And when she opened it up, she was astonished. Her eyes filled with tears, and she kept saying, where did you get these? Where did you get these? And I was like, oh. I listened, I paid attention to something that, oh, I didn't care less about hinge and whistles. What whoop do you need? But because it finally occurred to me, hang on, she wants this, I know how to get it for her, the two came together and I was able for once in my life to actually be sensitive to my own mother's need, which is something I had not been um, for most of my life. So here's what a melancholy is thinking, perhaps not consciously, but these are three maxims that run her mind, emotions, and often her choices. First of all, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing right. I see you know some melancholies. A place for everything and everything, everything in its place. place. And this next one, love means never having to say you're sorry. sorry. And this is a struggle for melancholies. It's something that I've really had to wrestle with with my husband, because here's the reasoning. If I try so hard to make things perfect, I will never make a mistake. And for me to say I'm star sorry would mean that somehow I had made a mistake and not been perfect. That is unthinkable. By definition, I never, I always do things perfectly. And so it can be very self-referential. And learning to realize, in some cases, that melancholies have other ways of saying I'm sorry other than actually saying those words out loud um, sometimes is an important thing to adapt. And for those of you who are melancholies, saying I'm sorry, it just restores connection. That's really all we're looking for is just, that wasn't what I was aiming for. That's all I need to hear. I'm not, I think for a melancholy, they're like, oh, I'm a horrible, dreadful, terrible person if I say I'm sorry. No, you know, I was off. We missed the mark. That's all I need to hear as a, as a sane one. All right, the next two personalities are a little less easy to um, identify. They're not quite as obvious, but there are still things you can look for. Um, what do you notice about my choleric purse, my powerful choleric purse? Oh. It is smaller, okay? It's compact. What else? Bold color. Bold color, nice and red. Yeah. All right, it's narrow. You notice that hand strap there? Uh -huh. It's very functional. Um, you're not going to lose it, and it can double as a weapon if you need to use it that way. <laughs> use it as a prompt to shake it for emphasis. All right, some visible clues that you or someone you know is a choleric. First is energy level. Cholerics tend to have more energy than anybody else, sometimes two and three times as much energy. And we don't tend to be nappers when we're little and when we're older. Um, sleep is a waste of time to a choleric. It's like there's just so many other better things I could be doing. And so we just keep going and going and going, like the Energizer Bunny. The second thing is there's a sense of presence in the body language, in the walk. Um, I change from flats into heels because I'm half, about half choleric, and I cannot walk like a choleric if I'm in flats. I feel like a duck. I have to have about two inch heels so I can have that stride. And if I'm on a tile floor, there's a click that comes with a choleric walk. Um, my, my daughter is more dominantly choleric than I am. Uh, like I said, I'm about 50-50, um, at least at home. And years ago, we went to a fair, a craft fair, and there was somebody who had made signs with the Mary Engelbright Queen of Everything, and then there was another sign that said Princess of Quite a Lot. So I thought, oh, this is cute. I bought the Queen of Everything for me, the Princess of Quite a Lot for her. We put them on our, our respective doors, and when I woke up the next morning, guess what she had done? She switched, she switched the sign. And so I talked to her, and I said, you know, honey, the Queen of Everything pays the bills. She quickly switched them back. And I promised her that when she gets her own place, I will buy her a Queen of Everything sign, and that will be for her to have in her place, but not in mine. All right, and then the third thing is function over fashion. Um, often, your choleric will have one basic color, black, okay? Um, one pair of nice black boots, one black purse, 
Um, I, about three years ago, branched out and I added brown. <laughs> it was really daring. <laughs> but it's, it's like, black goes with anything. And it's not too much thinking. So in my case, my clothing style tends to be much more choleric, and I, I tend to be a lot less um, sanguine in my clothing choices. Um, the goal in life of a choleric is represented by these car keys. They want to be in the driver's seat. They want to be in control. And here's the hardest thing to really realize is it's never personal. But they will come into any room, any situation, figure out who the most powerful person is, and try to take them down as fast as possible. First day of school, by the second day of school, if I have not identified my cholerics and given them a task to do, a, a way to co-lead with, with me in the classroom, I'm doomed. They will fight me the entire year. But if by the end of the first day I've identified them, pulled them aside and said, hey, I noticed some real leadership qualities in you. You have a great deal of charisma. And here's some things that I could really use some help with in the classroom. They think I'm brilliant for noticing because nobody else has and it's just it's just me looking around the class going oh okay because they have more energy than I do and there's one of them and one of me but there's like 30 other kids I have to pay attention to so if I don't identify them they can stage a coup within five minutes and I've never noticed that it's happened mm -hmm. um, and this is hard if you're at home and you've got smaller ones and you're like why are you fighting me I don't feel good today can't you have sympathy for me no you showed weakness you're going down <laughs> and again it's not personal and it feels so personal you're like you don't love me no they're just doing what comes naturally to them and when they're 25 and 30 and they're in charge of a major corporation these are going to be great skills but if you were a choleric female teenager high school was terrible because our society does not reward there's a word for choleric females that rhymes with itch, it's, it's, it's very unfair, okay? It's not right, and we don't, again, we don't come across that way on purpose, we don't look like we're trying to boss everybody around, we just, yeah, it's just who we are. Um, so, um, control is their goal in life. When um, my daughter was 21 months old is when my, my son was born, he was born about three years early, but that's a totally different story. Uh, and my mother gave her a, a doll, um, so that my, Anne Marie could have a baby because I just had a baby and it was a wonderful idea, it worked beautifully. And how many of you know the American Girl Company? Anybody oh, here? Okay, yes. this is a company, the sole purpose of which is to transfer all of your money into their bank account. Oh. And it, from what I've seen, they're very successful at doing this. And so she got Anne Marie the Bitty Baby doll and this beautiful basket and bunting and pillow and it just could not have been more gorgeous or high quality, by the way. Um, and so she showed Anne Marie how to tuck the baby, Anne Marie named it Baby Doll, and uh, tucked it in the basket, the bed, and covered it up. My mother did this, and then Anne Marie took one look at it and picked it up and went and shook everything out onto the floor. <laughs> and that was my mother's expression. She was horrified. And so Anne Marie then made a bed for the doll on the floor, the dirty floor that in our house has cat fur on it, oh, which is totally not perfect. My mother would never have an indoor animal. Um, so my mother did it again, you know, tuck, 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 and everything. And as soon as she got done, Anne Marie did the exact same thing. And, and my kids are small, so Anne Marie was this little tiny nut of a, you know, peanut of a child. And my mother is, you know, a full-grown adult. And so it was just hysterical watching this little kid undo all the work my mother had just done. And so my mother, ever, you know, she keeps coming on back because my mother is also <laughs> choleric. You know, she's going to have in, in control. So she does it again, and this time, um, and I, I didn't see this at the time, I had to see it on videotape in retrospect and recognize the look in my daughter's eye. I could see her going, okay, time to change strategies. She's bigger than I am, she's gonna win. And so my mother starts putting everything back in the basket and Anne Marie takes her little foot, sticks it in the basket, and stares off into outer space. And it was like she was serving notice, okay, Nana, you win today, but my day is coming. And she let the doll stay in, but she kept her foot in there for like the next half hour. And so my mother kept working around her foot, and my mother got what she wanted, except the foot stayed in the basket. So this control thing starts very young and continues throughout life. The first basic need of a choleric is represented by this list, this checklist. And how many of you are already feeling a shot of adrenaline from seeing all those little checks? Yeah, it's achievement. Cholerics need to achieve. They need to get things done. Um, my first year, no, my second year teaching, I was trying to get sympathy from my principal because I was pregnant and I had just bought a new computer, which was you know, in, back when you had a C prompt on the computer. Anybody remember those horrible oh, yes. days? There was no Web 2.0. Nothing was user friendly. No. No. 
and I had to be doing lesson plans, I had to be doing grading, and I was planning a banquet for my students and their parents, and, and I was telling them all these things that I was um, trying to achieve, and I was hoping for some sympathy, and what I was really hoping for was she would say, oh, Sherry, you know, you're pregnant, you got all this happening, you know, take a couple days off, and I'll come to classes for you. <laughs> and she did something that was an incredible favor, although at the time it, it made me so upset. She looked at me and she said, yes, Sherry, you really did do this to yourself, didn't you? And I had overloaded, I had over, in my zeal to achieve, my, yeah. my love of checking, checking, checking things off, I had chosen to do too much. I had bitten off to more than I could chew. And that voice I hear in the back of my head when I start saying yes to too many things and there's too many exciting, fun, new options that show up, I'm like, yes, Sherry, you sure did do it to yourself, didn't you? Oh, let's not go there again. And it's helped me hold in check the drive for achievement because Cholerics can tend to be human doings rather than human beings. Um, the whole idea of relaxing and doing nothing is an oxymoron to a colic. How do you do nothing? If it's nothing, you haven't done it. So let's do something rather than nothing. And for the next personality, the phlegmatic doing nothing makes total sense. We'll get there in a second. All right, the second major need of the choleric personality is represented by these thank you notes, and it's appreciation. A choleric does not need you to tell them that they did a good job because they already know they did a good job. If you say that was great, they'll say, I know. And they won't mean it arrogantly. What they mean is, by definition, if I did it, I would do it well because that's how I do things, that's who I am. Other people are like, oh, hey, isn't she all that? No, she's honest, sometimes known as blunt. But what they are dying to know and so often don't get, and since we are here at a, at a women's event, I'm going to tell you right now, one of the greatest gifts you can give anybody who's had a hand in organizing this event is tell them the impact they had on you in specific detail. Don't praise them. Tell them, you know, the story that you told about such and such, why that totally changed the way I'm thinking about my daughter. I'm going to go home and pick up the phone. They will be so thrilled that they made a difference in your life because that's why they're busy achieving. That's why they're doing, doing, doing is they want to make a difference. They want to change the world. They want to change that part of the world that they're in. And if you're in the world and you've told them that you've changed, 